so uh, without further ado, um, Dave, if you maybe want to come up and introduce yourself. This is our uh, entertainment, you call it, right? It's <laughs> our entertainment of the evening. Uh, our moderator, our timekeeper, our whip cracker. He's going to yeah, keep us on line from this point forward. I step aside and listen to Dave on our time and all those fun things. But um, this is Dave Taylor, for those of you who don't know, and uh, take it away, Dave, and then we'll have the rest of the panel join us. So what are we supposed to be doing? So we have until 8. Okay. Um, but Wait. You know, we want to leave time for Q&A, uh, okay. so we'll kind of see how the conversation goes. We, If we wrap up early and the conversation's good, then we're good. It's whatever we need, but we have till 8. I think that's kind of the time we have till. Okay. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, everyone. I gotta say, this is super exciting. After how long, how many times have you been staring at the camera on your computer and looking at people in little squares who think that because they can't see themselves, no one else can see them? And then they're doing really embarrassing things and you're like, oh my God, you're the one that needs to turn off your camera. <laughs> or you hear someone who takes a phone call in the middle of a meeting, right? And it's just like, can you please mute everybody else if you're talking? Can you just do it, please? So um, I actually am a digital storyteller. So I help companies figure out and tell their story. And that goes all the way from, I do a ton of consumer electronics reviews. I've worked in the consumer electronics space for a really long time. I've been a judge at CES for probably 15 years. Um, and I have more electronics than you do. Let's just put that out on the table. <laughs> I have more headphones than you have electronics. <laughs> right? I should have brought some. It's like, yes, grab that gift. Yes, that was a mistake on my part. Um, but I also work with companies on things like training videos or product walkthroughs. I'm a professor of EU, so I actually interact with students via Zoom on different time zones, which is a whole other exciting thing. They're all really, really good at not being actually paying attention, as they do in classes, too, where they also don't pay attention. But it's a whole other story. Um, for this, we're going to be talking about robotics. And I wanted to start out by observing that today I spent a lot of time dealing with robots. So first off, I have a robot lawnmower. And I left my house, and it was mowing my backyard. But I need to do a firmware update. So what did I have to do to do the firmware update? I had to drive my robot to Bertha to the service center because they don't do customer firmware updates. You have to take it to a tech to make sure you don't brick your expensive lawnmower. So I spent a third of my day like babysitting my robot. Meanwhile, while I was doing that drive, I set my vacuum to going and I came home and it had spent a couple of hours. It has LiDAR, it does 3D mapping. It's very slick, very sophisticated. So all of that's going on on the day we're gonna talk about robots. and. My point with that, and then sort of in a more subtle way, I'm driving my car here and it has automatic lane departure warnings, right? So as I'm driving, if I'm not paying attention, it'll steer me back into my lane, right? All of this is part of robotics. All of this is part of the idea that the technology isn't passive devices that we just tell it what to do, but that they start to actually sort of participate and take part and improve the process. Now, we have two really great people that are going to be on the panel, and we're going to be talking about enterprise robotics. But I just want to start out by saying, I bet you interact with more robots than you realize. And soon enough, you're going to go to the pizzeria, and instead of it being a classic Jersey experience where the guy has a cigarette, and there's so much ash on the end of it that you're praying it doesn't fall on your crust while he's working on it. Right? Anyone experience this? That's a very New Jersey pizza experience. It's going to be a robot. You're going to push a button. It's going to be like a DIA. You're going to push a button. You're going to watch it go down a conveyor belt and make a custom pizza for you, right? So part of the question with robotics is what is it? What are the implications? What's the ethics of robots? You know, not just like the three laws of robotics. I'm going to quiz you guys. I hope you know the three laws because you're going to need to. Okay, but it's also the question of how much do we want to take away from how much do we want to re-engineer you know, re and rethink things? I mean, I could be replaced by a robot. I'm sure that the kind of jokes I have are really easy to program. <laughs> it's just like hashtag dad joke and you're good. Um, but how far do we want to go? So with that, I want to actually invite both of my esteemed panelists to come up. 
And I'm going to each of you introduce yourself. And I know one of you is going to have to be in the back. Oh, good, good job. You volunteered. So. Well, I, knew, I, knew that, I knew that it would become a fight, so I was like. Good man. All right. So then, <laughs> Caleb, why don't you introduce yourself first? Uh, my name is Caleb Eastman. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Winter Winds Robotics. Um, we have two divisions. One is our consulting division, which does a lot of uh, embed software development and robotics development um, for uh, some of the larger order, some of the larger companies, Fortune 500 companies mostly. And then uh, we, the other division is our R&D division, where we develop products um, that we see that needs to have in the market. Um, all of this is sort of designed to culminate in our our end game as a company is to develop um, our own our own robot uh, for the moon and Mars, uh, particularly for getting water ice off of the poles of the moon and, and Mars. There's lots of reasons why you want water off Earth's surface, and I can talk about that at length at any time, but not now. <laughs> so, Excellent. Well, yes, yeah, so Jalali Hartman. So first of all, thanks for having us here. It's kind of surreal to have a live event. Um, so I own a company called Roboto down the street here. We bring technology to life. So if you have a prototype idea or some kind of enterprise robotics system you're trying to build, uh, we can get it off the ground much cheaper, more, more efficiently. If you go and try to hire your whole team yourself, or and they, so we kind of have all the disciplines covered. We have a base platform. We can to spin these things up quickly. Um, we've made a million mistakes already, so you don't have to. Uh, trust you me. can make the next one. Yeah, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so right here in Longmont, eight years. Uh, actually started, got my start going to meetups, and I uh, got our first big customer after I moved out of my house. It was five years in my house. Moved to a co-working place down the road. Within a month, somebody walked up to me and hired us. Right? So. I, I think I think we met at first start with Yeah, we did. Yeah. And, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I knew nobody in this. I knew I moved here from another state. Yeah. Met everybody. Actually, a lot of the people here. Great. Yeah, so, I love that. so let's start out. What's the difference between robots and robotics and enterprise robotics? How do you differentiate those two? Yeah. So, okay. So for me, um, I'm going to just uh, place a stake in the ground and say that robotics, are, in order for a robot to be a robot, it must both act upon and sense the physical world, and it must also have software on board. Um, and that cuts out a lot of things off the edges and makes it a lot simpler. Enterprise robotics uh, requires an addition of two things. One is that for me to consider an enterprise robot, it must interact with humans in some way. So the robots in the cage that you see in industrial robotics, robotic welders, I don't consider those enterprise robotics because they don't have any, they don't interact with humans. I was gonna say they interact with humans, but not. Not the way that you want to. Because <laughs> you don't, they don't want to go to a, you know, a cage for robots. <laughs> Uh, the other thing for enterprise robotics, from my perspective, which knocks out a lot of consumer robots, is that it must be able to inter interact with and integrate with enterprise systems. So that is in ER ERPs, uh, SCADA systems, MES systems, any, anything that is generally used in enterprise, uh, it, that, that those sort of integrations, um, you know, Active Directory, etc. cetera, the, uh, an enterprise robot must be able to do that or else I wouldn't consider an enterprise robot. Okay, and you're differentiating that from like industrial and manufacturing. Too. Yeah, so, okay, so I, I'm, I'm actually including a little bit of what people call manufacturing robots in enterprise, and then I mentioned SCADA systems, et cetera, and the integration. There's, if, if it can interact with people and it can interact with other systems, I consider it an enterprise robot. So I do leave out on the edges here the robots in cages and the robots that are just designed for interacting with people in a consumer environment. Um, and there's a big hole middle, which, uh, which some people might say there's some of the factories, on, some of the robots on the factory floor, especially the ones that are, have collaborative, like, like Yumi, et cetera, I would put in enterprise robots, um, but that's just because I have a really weird viewpoint on things. Oh, that's excellent. <laughs> All right, Jalali, counterpoint. Yeah, so I like Caleb. Caleb's like a robotics purist. Right? Like he's, he's exactly right about all that stuff. Um, I'm more on a, I'm more of a capitalist that knows about robots. Right? Uh, I have a first five years of this business. I had a consumer product. We're trying to get a consumer product. Uh, it's probably 
honestly the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I don't know why exactly, other than you have a lot of competition. Um, as soon as you get something that's working, everybody else can easily copy it. And there's this weird thing where everybody thinks a robot can do all these things that it just can't yet. Right, so they see they seem like the Jetsons, and they think they're going to buy this robot for like a hundred dollars, and it's going to like, it's just not there yet. I mean, you guys probably came closest with Misty, but I right, it's like well, that was for example, I had a little Raspberry Pi robot, and then Misty came out. It was like okay, and then Spiro came out with a little Rover, right? So that's kind of what happens. You got to be real fast to get out a lot of money for your market. So when I think about enterprise robotics, I think about enterprise customers. Right? I'm, I'm less purist. I'm more. Is this device taking some data and making a decision that it, that it wouldn't otherwise, right? Is it controlling some controls, is it sensing something, acting, thinking, doing something, right? So, um, but that's where we're at, and we, we made that shift, and actually what we did, we said, oh, well, we actually love this consumer product, let's just give it to people. Like, you know, we put it in schools in Boulder, we do all the, with all the after schools, at the libraries, right? Um, we weren't making any money on it. And when I made that shift and said, actually, these things that I learned with this little toy, keeping them connected, having them nav, the voice, all of these different things, sending data to the cloud, right? Suddenly I'm like, there's a whole bunch of customers that need that same thing. And that's where we really all of a sudden started to make that switch. So I was against it. Like I knew I could do robotic services and stuff, but I really, really wanted to make this little thing like you see in the movies. And uh, it's hard. Like it's hard. It just is. I don't know. I'm sure some of you are better at it than I would be, but it was it took a lot out. Uh, took a ton of money, and I think we were kind of laughing earlier. They were laughing at me. It was like we. I got into robotics. I started a robotics company because I wanted to start a robotics company, right? And that's a huge mistake, <laughs> right? There was no need. I had no idea about any of it. In fact, I went to a new tech meetup early on and presented at CU, and people laughed at me. Like I was like presenting this Raspberry Pi, and they're like, "Isn't that a Raspberry Pi that you just buy?" And I was like, "I was all excited about it, you know." <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's kind of how I got like, but I didn't know what I didn't know, right? So that's the problem. You go out and you think, "Oh, this is gonna be great, and everybody's gonna buy this," but you don't know what else there. And I never once talked to a customer. Never once sat down and said, "Like, what would you actually use?" You know, this. So that's what that's kind of the hard lesson that I had to learn, right? So, um, but yeah, I don't really, I don't really define them the same with Caleb. Caleb, has it, have any of you guys seen this, some of the stuff that he's doing? I don't think you shared any of it. No, at some point, <laughs> yeah. Caleb's one was like quite. I was actually having a meet, a meet up, and I was like, nobody showed up, and then all of a sudden, Caleb walking in with this this Mars rover thing, and I was like, what the heck is this guy? Um, so, and it's come a long way. I just saw the big one. Yeah. So, cool. The Mars rover one. No, I would. What would you classify that as? Well, so that was that was. The, that's more, uh, I think you're talking about the proof of concept. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. So that one is that one. The locomotion is the rocker bogey style locomotion, but from a there's nothing about that robot that can't interact with both people and 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 uh, enterprise systems. And so that one can be an enterprise robot. And for me, it's really about how it's used rather than uh, than the, the, the how it's built. Like so. Drones, robot arms, and mobile robots, uh, ground robots, can all be enterprise robots. Right, so, I mean, I think of the Nexus 6 models from Blade Runner, right, where they were created to be sort of like ultimate, if you will, robots for extremely dangerous environments. So, to me, one of the things you're talking about is the idea of having robots be able to sort of augment human experience or human interaction in an environment that otherwise would be essentially impossible or extremely, extremely expensive. Bottom of the ocean, mm -hmm. uh, at Fukushima reactor, on oh. Mars, on the moon, you know, all of those sort of places where, well, you could do it, but you're gonna be glowing orange afterwards. Probably not a great idea, but a robot, we can let it run, and after a month, we have to crash it, but that's okay, we'll build another one, you know. So I love putting I love the, uh, you know putting robots in those areas. It's just surprising how many situations humans get into because dangerous situations that we get into because robotics aren't there yet. Particularly when it comes to so you know one of the use cases that you know we're working on is for wildland firefighting. And if any of you have ever been a wildland firefighter or know what that's like, then you understand that it's incredibly very it's very dangerous. It's very labor intensive. It's very, uh, very dangerous. 
and um, and and so it's not an ideal place for a human to be. And we're not our, we're not really built to handle that kind of situation. Right? And so, uh, but we also we also will be there for the foreseeable future. And so a robot that's operating in that environment must must a be better than a human at that at that particular job. And B, you must be still be able to interact with humans who are there. And so that's, you know, so I would actually consider a, a uh, robots that are on the fire line, enterprise robots. Okay, so then obviously one of the pieces here is autonomy. When we think of the Mars rover, as has been highlighted in many science fiction films, is that time delay really gets in the way of you sitting here at Cape Canaveral and controlling something that's that far away. So yeah. is autonomy a necessary ingredient for robotics? Yeah, I mean, they're not really that useful without it, honestly. Um, the, you know, even the Mars rovers are really dumb, like really dumb. Um, and and in particular in um, what we call fitter, which is fault, discovery, isolation, recovery, humans are really good at fitter. Um, and and so the better that autonomous systems, because the nice things about autonomous systems is that they don't lack attention to, you mentioned the link cube, the example, they're always one. They can, they never get tired. They never get, um, but, you know, um, there is a whole thing that I could go into around what we call causality that robots are very bad at. Robots do not understand causality uh, today. And so we have to get better at, Developing, putting, uh, uh, moving causality versus pro uh, probability into robot intelligence. Okay, so so I'm going to play on or pick on just a word you just used, and then I'm going to actually throw it to you to talk about. Because you said understand. So do you see that in the near term future we'll be able to have robots that will actually process and understand and make decisions based on the environmental data they collect? What do you? Think? I mean, to me, it seems a little far off. And I think Caleb's probably one of the closest ones. I'm not, I haven't talked to some, like I said, kind of from AMP, right? Like they're doing, there's a lot of stuff that's like real automated, right? And getting real smart. It all depends on pretty clean data sets coming out, right? And I think what Caleb's talking about is if you don't have a clean data set and you're just trying to like figure it out, I feel like we're a ways off. And it's, and these things are hard for me to even come to because like my whole day literally was going through forum posts that are wrong, trying to get things to connect. Then the driver is the wrong driver, right? Like well, that's my world. So like, when you talk about all oh, this thing's gonna just like talk to us and figure out what we need for lunch and stuff, I just I'm like, okay, maybe one day. Um, but I don't know. Caleb's a lot deeper into that. I'm more of a customer. So I'm more like, let's get something just functional that just kind of works decent. Let's not worry about making it smart. He's trying to figure out things like if the thing gets nuked or hit by a boulder, it can rebuild itself and figure out where it's at. Kind of stuff. It's like, that's... Well, if it gets nuked and it's on Mars, then we got a whole other way. There's a microchip. There's like an like 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 electron somewhere in the sort of... Right, but I mean, I, I think about like robot vacuum cleaners. How many people have one? Okay, so the first generation of those were awful. And the biggest issue that they had that none of the manufacturers wanted to own was if you had a dog that went poop, right? It's really disgusting, but if you think about what a robot vacuum would do to that, that's 20 times more disgusting. <laughs> They're still working on that. Yeah. And so we're talking about these, you know, and, and I have ones that have LIDAR. I can show you maps of how it's like assessed and figured out my house at, at relative elevations, and it can sense hardwood versus carpet and everything. And I'm not entirely convinced that if my dog actually had an accident that it wouldn't say, well, I don't know, it looks like dirt, so I'm gonna just keep plowing forward, you know. Um, so you talk about understanding, it's a big, do you think you can do it? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, in order to do that, the, I mean, I'll, I'm gonna make some bold statements here, but um, We're so, just so please feel free, <laughs> please feel free to um, take it with a grain of salt. But, um, Almost the entire artificial intelligence machine learning community is wrong, okay? Because they're all there's a huge focus on neural nets and improving neural nets, which is fine for classification, it's fine for detection of problems, but that's they're not that's not a reasoning, that's not something you can use to reason. So, in order to do reasoning, 
Um, you know, there's the way you know the way hum the way humans do it. You know, there's three levels we call three rungs of intelligence. One is associative, associative, uh, which is x. If I see x, then y. Uh, that's that's uh, that's where robots are today. Where you know, um, and that's you know that's where neural nets are today, and that's you know a lot of the AI community, ML community is focused on. Level two is what's called uh, interventional thinking, meaning that if I if I do x, I know that y will occur. This is where toddlers are. Um, this is, um, but the last one, which is where thinking adults are, is what's called counterfactual, which is that you could imagine what it's like, what the world would be like if you were one foot taller. You could imagine that. That's counterfactual thinking. That's the, being able to imagine things that aren't here in the world. Well, counterfactual thinking happens to be where a lot of our high level reasoning occurs, is that we can we can we can take pat we can take patterns that we've seen in the past. We can create scenarios that have never occurred or that we have never seen, and we can still we can still operate in that environment. There is a there is a mathematical uh, underpinning to this, um, what they call causal inference, which is if you ever want to look at uh, Judeo Pearl, the Book of Why, I strongly encourage you to read that. But if we if if we're gonna if we have to we have to focus on the math of causality if we're going to get to a point where robots can reason. And right now, the large part of the data science community is focused on the math of probability and just building more sophisticated uh, models or algorithms that are based on, still again, about probabilistic uh, notions. And not only is it a very compute intensive, um, but it also, will, it also won't allow, give robots the ability to reason. So, uh, so it depends, to me, I'll say it depends on how long the data science community focuses on the math probability. Uh, to the extent that they do that is the extent to which we'll never get past this sort of plateau we're at right now. So. Okay, so RoboCop, who's seen it? RoboCop? Okay, so remember ED-409 in RoboCop, right? That was like the ultimate law enforcement robot that went wacko and like killed people? Right? So robots and safety. So if we have it in a cage, as you say, mm -hmm. on an assembly line with a yellow line painted around it saying, for God's sake, don't go in that line. You don't know what's going to happen. But, you know, in a modern factory, the robots are moving around. Mm -hmm. And in fact, even in an office building, the robots might be delivering mail or, you know, dropping off packages on different floors and stuff. So I feel like, you know, it might be a little bit Hollywood, but... As you develop robots, how do you bake in safety to make sure that they're not going to like spin out of control and shoot bolts off into the wall, which would actually make this space look even more cool? <laughs> but I don't recommend it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, the first thing I would say is like all technology fails eventually. That's been my experience of some problems where they have to like hit the button or something. So that's a little scary. Um, Second of all, I think we're a long, personally a long, long ways off before we have to worry about any physical robots like coming after us, right? There's a lot of ways, just for me, it's, it seems far -fetched. Okay, but you say that, but the city of New York, the NYPD actually had like this robot jaguar thing. You guys see pictures of that? And they actually, people lost their minds. They were so anxious about this like robot creature that could run and get involved in a you know, high stakes situation that the city just said, you know what, we're done. We're pulling it out, we'll never use this again. So I don't know that we're as far as you suggest. Well, from that I, mean, sort of I don't know what that was, but like this, let's say the Boston Dynamic Spot, isn't that remote control? It's not actually a robot. You, know, uh, you see a lot of these things, but... Our, yeah. uh, actually, I can follow the chair on that. There's actually a whole community out of Oregon, okay, where actually, I don't use the word AI, machine learning, and we'll put them in by our sensors. I have these robots. Okay. Small ones I built myself. Where I'm training it, I'm trying to figure out how I want to run around, I want to go out in the yard, I want to meet my dog. So we're we're getting, we're really progressing. I I don't disagree with that at all. It's, it's incredible progress, but there's a big step I feel like from that to this thing's going to get a notion that's going to hurt someone and figure out how to do it. Well, but I, I'm not necessarily saying that, though, you know, hackers, just accidentally but, well, but hackers are already, like, and not just hackers, but terrorists are also looking at, like, drones. 
And that's something we're starting to see in the Middle East, which is this like a, a completely freaky idea. So you know, weaponized drones that they can then remotely control and, and send into a hotspot. You know, in bad ways, not good ways. There's a difference between the hacker taking that over and the thing just suddenly deciding that it hates humans. Right? Yeah. Like, or, yeah, well that's like next year. Right? Like that's <laughs> so what I see, this is what I see. Everybody's almost everybody thinking about the robots you see them on TV. I know personally of real use cases where AI is hurting us now, right? I don't want to say hurting us, but it's being used in ways that we don't even understand. And that, to me, that's a bigger problem. Like it's going on now. Let's worry about that. Caleb's device is never going to rear up in my lifetime and come after me. Right. Like it's now that you've suggested it. I mean, I mean, the Jalali line. There's, there's a long, there's a, there's this, what's, what's it called? The, the chasm. It's just, it's not there yet. I don't know. Maybe some of you guys are better than I am. So I don't know. But I don't what's see. It? What's your take on this? So when we talk about safety, the most, the most likely way that a robot becomes unsafe is something going something going wrong with some some like with bugs basically so like there's 25 million lines of code in the Linux kernel okay so there's tons of ways in which something can go wrong where there was no intent behind it it just goes wrong and for this so luckily we have been we have been running you know what we call control systems as a a species for now in 30, 30 years, which are computer controlled ways that we interact with our physical world. So, what the electrical grid runs on, it's what the water systems run on. And we have all these, we have these really, uh, really involved, very painful standards uh, IEC 62443, IEC 61580, there's uh, ACL 26262. There's a whole bunch of standards that are like. I'm going to interrupt you for a second because you two guys back there. We're gonna have a quiz later, so remember all those numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. Yeah. We have we have a concept called safety integrity levels, where we we measure the likelihood that a malfunction would cause harm to humans, and we measure the likelihood that there will be a certain number of humans around a thing, and we'll literally say this thing has to meet safety integrity level four, and this is what they're doing in this is the ACL. ACL is automotive safety integrity levels, which is what they require everything from the software for, for autonomous vehicles. This is why autonomous vehicles, uh, you know, they run on a different operating system, like the export for the real, you know, for the real time operating system. Um, there's, there's latency considerations. They don't even use the same computer, the same type of computer, the same operating system that that most people have ever already heard of. For, for all this, for all this. Because yeah. when you deal with this kind of robot, um, and you're dealing with that kind of that kind of force it can generate, they really they really you know we're really concerned about that. And so I spent a huge amount of time just meeting safety and integrity levels and latency requirements and reducing uh, redu you know, mitigating risk. Just it's it's like. It's literally like you know, ten times safer than a human operating it. Currently. Yeah, which so, is yeah, yeah. That, that's where like Tesla's. Really that's what Tesla's right. right. Because Tesla's cars are better than human drivers, and so for what like a billion miles on the road, they'll have three accidents and two people will die, and people are like, oh my god, we're so not ready. And it's just like compare that to any human driver, and you'll find that any human driver, if they drove a billion miles, would have killed like thirty people, easily. Or more. Yeah, or, 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 I mean, that's just my daughter we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, honey, you're not supposed to watch this. <laughs> I mean, to, I, to, I totally get it. No, in Tesla, they're right. They have way more training miles. This is the problem. You take away that training model, and it's dumb as could be, right? And that's the problem with all this stuff. We're all designing, yes, we can get machine learning, track and operate. Yes, we can get this working. But pulling it all together to where it's like thinking in real time, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because Google just a couple of days ago announced the next generation of Google Translate, and they were making a big deal of the fact that when they went to translate a word, they would also look at the word before it and the word after it. And I was like, well, what have you been doing for the last 15 years of your translation software? 
you know, and their translator is pretty good. Yeah. You know, we're getting pretty good with translation. Um, and that's just a tiny subset of the complexity of like having an autonomous car swing over here. Someone puts like some four boys in the window and then it drives off and comes to my house and, and drops it off on my front doorstep. The only thing about this is the text. So that's a good example. So Google, that's a perfect example. They had all of the human language to study, right? That's how they're able to get it good. But what happens if you don't have that and you can't do that and you don't have that nice data stream of words coming in? It gets real tricky, right? Then you have to make like inference. I think it's that. I think it's that. Maybe I'll do this. And I think that's where the perception, of, even when we get customers come to us, they have this like grandiose thing or this thing, and you're like, yeah. Um, we might be able to do like some of those tasks correctly, right? But it's not going to do all of this stuff. And honestly, Caleb was, and they're one of the first ones where they're kind of don't agree with me on that, right? They're kind of thinking the next generation, I think even literally, like, yeah, they're they, building they, systems for the next. Right, generation. because, yeah, because all of the, yeah, because the, the standardized way that data science typically works today. You're absolutely right. It's never going to get past probabilistic, basically, you know, glorified classifiers, um, and that's you know that's the problem with that's the problem with having an entire cottage industry build up around what was originally statistics. And you know they they said you know there's a very famous term they call you know, correlation is not causation. Well, if you you look at data science today, it's almost purely you know. The, the child of statistics. So. Yeah, and to me, the best example of that are recommendation engines. Yeah. So I just laugh. I mean, you go look at something like Netflix or Amazon Prime Video, and they're like, because you watch this movie, here are seven completely unrelated movies that you might like that actually are really horrible. Mm -hmm. And that seems like a pretty constrained space because they have vast amounts of data to work with. But it's just like Amazon recommending another purchase. There's no way for them to know that someone borrowed my account and bought, uh, you know, makeup or something, and suddenly now I'm getting all these makeup ads. You know, we live in a world where there's like this veneer of sophistication, but underneath it, I'm not sure how sophisticated things really are. So I want to open it up for questions, but before we get there, I do. I warn you guys. Three laws of robotic. Isaac Asimov. Go. <laughs> I don't know the last one. I won't hurt anybody. Yeah. They can't, 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 can't hurt. That's the first law. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyone know the three laws? <laughs> <laughs> I remember reading about first years ago. It's implied with financial inaction. Oh, okay. Right. Never can, right. can you give him like a, a beer or something? <laughs> so he's surprised. That's great. So, okay, the first law, and this I think is still relevant, which is where Asimov just was just crazy bright guy. Um, a robot may not injure a human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. Mm -hmm. And then the second law is a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And then the third law is a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. So do you feel like that's baked into modern robots? No. <laughs> so we're all doomed, I'm sorry. It, 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 it depends, it depends. Yeah. There's, there's some, there are there are some really really like I said, there's been a lot of thought placed into what they call safety integrity ethics. So it's there those are kind of interwoven into those, you know. Yeah, and there's some classic ethics issues here too. So like with Tesla, if a car would take out a half a dozen people on a crosswalk, or it could run into a building and just take out its driver, which choice should it make? Right? That's an ethics question. And we are now in a situation and in a world where that's starting to be relevant. I mean, if my robot vacuum cleaner says, I don't want to deal with this room, okay, whatever. You know, I'll just go and kick it or something. But if my car says, hey, there might be people on that crosswalk, I'm going to do something different that you're not expecting, then that makes me very anxious. <laughs> so. so this is a true story. I was in an event at Boulder Library, fourth graders. There's one kid who's kind of anti-socialist in the back. He, within the time of class, he got on about every device we had and shut them down. Right? So I didn't teach him that, nothing. He looked it up, Google it. Right? So that's more what I think about. Because that kid's a fourth grader. You get someone like Caleb, you get on anything. Right? <laughs> well, they, they, I'm I glad they just compared no, to the fourth no, grader. 
I will tell you, I'll tell you right I mean, now. It's not secure, yeah. folks. I'll tell you right <laughs> now, do not piss off controls engineers. Yeah. I'll just say that right, <laughs> right off the bat. Because if someone like, you know how an elevator works, you know how an escalator works, you know how everything runs, and it all uses the same system, so if someone understands the systems, don't don't piss, don't piss control here. Okay, I just want to say you might have just lost plausible deniability. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't admit to being control <laughs> All right, so if we have any questions or comments or observations, I know there's some smart robot people in the audience, not necessarily people that are robots, but who knows? Yeah. So I had uh, the autonomy uh, versus enterprise uh, for a firefighting robot, uh, a former wildland firefighter. Um, uh, I don't think anybody should be doing that job considering the technology that we have. Um, and a lot of it is on uh, really uneven ground. So this one, this sermon we had last summer, uh, inaccessible areas where they just let it burn because it is inaccessible. So when we have, uh, when we build a robot for backcountry wildland firefighting, is it going to be autonomous? Um, it should be at least be semi-autonomous. Um, it really depends. So for example, when they're doing indirect, doing indirect in its job is to dig a trench, then autonomy, it can be as autonomous as a, the vacuum cleaners that we have in our house today, right? Uh, if it's doing direct fire attack, then it's gotta be able to do quite a bit. Um, we say autonomous, it's a big gradient. So the, way, the answer I'll give you is that it should be autonomous enough to be able to do a job to do a specific task that we know that, because we know we know what we would want a robot to do in wildland. So you should be able to do that task and be able to handle adversity within that task. So autonomous in that sense. But if it's gonna like, if it's really gonna like decide on its own when to do direct fire attack or when to switch to direct fire attack, that I don't think that it, I don't think, it, I don't, it, that, that could be considered within the realm of autonomy and I don't think that robots are ready for that yet. Right, and that scenario is interesting anyway because one of the other things that they're looking at is having drones that are doing like infrared to do accurate mapping. And so unintended consequences, what's the first thing that emergency services have to say? All of you with personal drones, don't fly them in this damn area because you're getting in the way of what we're trying to accomplish. Right, and so, you know, it's like, so now we have drones that are supposed to have baked in no-fly zones. But those are fixed based on like distance from an airport. But if we have a fire breakout and you want to have those drones directing those robots that are right on the front line, because I agree, no human being should be put at that level of risk. Then what happens when that drone gets banged by some individual drone who's taking live streaming footage for the Instagram channel? You call Roboto talks. And so now it cranks it up, right? Because now we're talking, let's have drones that can take out other drones, which I absolutely admit sounds awesome, <laughs> but unintended consequences. So what are they going to do? How are they going to know? Are they going to use IFF transponders like they do in airplanes? So you've gone down the, the, the actor road here. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I wasn't going there. I, I, I just want to go. I just, that's where I <laughs> I think there's, a, there's like a very clear, a couple clear examples right here in this room, right? Of, there's this adoption curve in robotics where, so Caleb's device, this autonomous thing will be on, on Mars that's kind of in one spot. Um, you take someone like Amped, that's a real practical application that's making money now, right? It's like, it's not exactly what we saw in the Jetsons, but it's actually what we need. Okay, tell us a tiny bit about Amped. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Or give, give yeah, us a 60 second pitch, go. What is it? Uh, so single stream recycling, you know, you throw everything into a single recycle bin. It has to go to a big facility and get sorted out uh, into the constituent materials. Uh, a lot of people do that by hand currently. So AMP makes robots that use neural networks to classify the material visually and, and pick it out, uh, sort it out by material. Good, because I've always been really suspicious when I go to places and they say we have a universal recycle bin that it really is a, is a tunnel that goes straight to their dumpster. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. So yeah, you know the, the big rule is don't don't put your diapers in recycling because that's one of the things you pick out the most, right? But yeah, yeah. people yeah. do diapers are really bad for robots. Yeah, 
Covered in slides. Right. Right. More backwards, actually. You see what I'm saying? And the dog poop. I know, it's see, we're coming full circle. You see what I'm saying? It's taking a job yeah. that it's humans like they want to fire for six money. Right. They figure out a way to do that. Yeah. Right, okay, so, but humans don't want to do, but there are humans doing this job, right? It's so, yeah. okay, so, so your robot is arguably taking away human jobs, right? So one of the challenges, I think, with robotics, certainly if you went to a Ford assembly plant 40 years ago versus one today, they're different because of the innovation and because of robotics and automation. So at what point do you say we shouldn't develop this robot because this is gonna to put too many people out of work? And a corollary of that is that the workforce needs to continually be trained, which we in this country do a terrible job at. You know? yeah. So, you know, I'll use the amp example. The truth is, is that AMP's in a good area in that there's not a, there's literally not enough single stream recycling happening at all because there's not enough there's not enough the ability to remove the stuff that you don't want in the stream or that the stream can't handle you know, the trash the people wish cycling stuff into the trap into the recycling like there's just not enough like so you know the way that I see robotics is right now no one no one worries about the jobs that have been removed from control systems because people don't think about control systems anymore. The people don't even know that the that the, the, the amount of chlorine that's being injected into the water supply in Longmont is being done by an automated system. And that it happens too fast, too repeatedly, too much for a human to do it. And so a lot of robot companies are focused on replacing jobs, but there's so much that we don't even bother to do that because we can't imagine a human doing that. And you know, just like you know, all the all the you know, basically all the systems that we rely on to survive, we would always, always inspect those systems if we could. We might send someone around once a week. We there's not enough so so I, I guess the way that I would put it is there's there's a huge gap between you know things we just don't do today that robots could do and should be doing uh, versus just you know using them as a way as a means to replace humans and that's I think it really just depends on you know on, on how that works so that's that's where I think that robotics have the most you know uh, have the most use in the near term. Uh, State of Colorado hired us. A couple years ago to train blue collar workers in robotics. So that's kind of their pushing it. My feeling is the opportunities are there. Um, if you're in a job that a robot could do, you might want to start uh, start thinking about something else, honestly. Um, I'm seeing the stuff, especially with this, everybody's on like the you know deferment or quarantine or whatever, and the restaurants can't find anybody. So I just saw a thing on the news. This guy's like, well, I had to hire a robot. Like he's, he literally got zero applicants to serve. So he's got a robot making salads. You've got a robot that brings it around to the tables, right? So in a way, kind of one of the things that I'm seeing with all this is this pandemic is accelerating some of this stuff. Right? And I don't know why exactly, uh, but it's we're been inundated. I'm not even busy. Yeah. It's just everybody now wants automation. If they can remove that risk of the person, like right, let's do it. Oh, right. There's also the other side of that, and that is the like I'm interested. I'm working on this. How do I? If you're going to China, they're industrial. How do I bring it back to the United States? The only way I can make high quality parts is robotic. But I need them. Yeah. How do you, how do I get that? You know, I'm, I'm and and you know, this actually is a lot there's a lot of there's a concept that's well known in, in the enterprise industrial space that some of you may have never heard of called the Great Crew Change. You know, you guys don't know about the Great Crew Change. It is the fact that there's a huge the the, gen, the you know what they call the boomer generation. There's a huge percentage of, the, of that generation that was subject matter experts on a particular thing, and they are all retiring. And the next generation, the millennials and the, the generation after Z, I think is what they're called, um, don't want to do those jobs and don't want to specialize in that thing for 30 years. And what that means is right now there's a huge knowledge gap and and uh, and. and and, and in particular, a gap where the way that millennials would rather solve that problem is by automating it and being an expert in the automation of things. 
And so where robots can provide a lot of the benefit is where subject, ma subject matter expertise subject matter expertise and the willingness to be hands-on has, has to has to be replaced by um, by you know something that can automate the, the physical part as well as can be worked on by people whose knowledge is the automation of things. And so I honestly am worried that we won't replace jobs with robots fast enough for there to be a huge bunch of things that we rely on today to work that flat out won't work and we don't have a plan for that. And so people worry about jobs in, you know, um, and most of the jobs that people are worried about, you know, being replaced are miserable jobs. But also, millennials and, and, and people in Generation Z won't do those jobs. They won't do them. And so the only way that we could actually get them done or have the society run as we expect it to today is to mitigate the entropy that's being caused. And, um, and that, and honestly, we're not, we're worried about the wrong things. It's not, it's, the problem is, is that there won't be enough people who know what they're doing to, you know, run the mission critical systems that we rely on. I would argue that's happening now, right here. Like, right, I can't get the people that I need. I agree with you. It's like, this is, so, I know you have a lot of luck, but it's like, well, no, it is a, it is a problem. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a huge problem to have, you know, um, and it's happening everywhere. It's happening everywhere sort of under the surface. Um, and if anyone wonders why it seems like all of these systems, electrical grids, less resilient, all these things, if all these things are happening, it just seems like the infrastructure is crumbling because it is, right? And there's, if it seems like there's not enough upkeep being placed on all these systems, it's because there's not. And it's only gonna get worse, and so, I, I don't think worrying about jobs being taken by robots is the problem we're going to have in five years, ten years. I uh, used to run a store just uh, down the way here, so people remember it, Luddite Electronics. And um, <laughs> so I have found people who were willing consumers uh, to pay to have old Luddite boxes repaired. And it's amazing, actually. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't do that anymore, but... Um, um, there are, it wasn't just like old stereos and stuff. People would bring to me old tabulators. I, I once worked on a, 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 a scoreboard sign, you know, because there's nobody else around to know what that was. And all it's gone. Any chance you can fix it? can't find it, but it runs the diode is. It's a what? Yeah, you know, that electric typewriter. I, I've got an old Smith Curran electric typewriter that uh, was working. No, but we can automate it. Well, you can figure that out. I'm, I'm retired. It's actually, <laughs> it's, it's actually funny you mention that because <laughs> now we're now we're developing electronics such that that we don't even bother to think about maintaining them. Like for example, right here, the we used to you know. We used to, you know, I would think that any smaller than 0402 on a PCB is going to be hard to hard to work on later. So now we don't even make electronics in such a way that they can be maintained. We expect to throw them away. Yeah, working to the component level of any microscope. Yeah, it's hard. And, and, I, and I have uh, to use a microscope to do this. Yeah. <laughs> Jennifer? Yeah, well, you know, you talk about the, the deficit of the knowledge base and how. So what age does that start? And there's obviously a huge boom in young generations interested in robotics. Talk a little bit about where's that disconnect happening? What, at what age does that transition to different skills that need to happen? And how do you see, is there a way to fill that gap? And what age is that? Uh, yes, yeah, so like we heard a fair amount of interns now from Tim Green and Goldman. They're great. I've uh, seen it. Uh, there's a guy here who builds robotics for schools. I can't think of his name. I've been trying to do all these years. It was real COVID. And he, uh, he actually said, this, this part of the answer is kindergarten. Uh, and he, he makes these little robot things to teach them how to teach them to learn math, decision making, stuff that you need to know to run a robot. 
but he starts at kindergarten. Yeah, there definitely is no too young age at this point. Um, the only thing I would say is that we need, as a community, to do a better job at teaching some of the other skills. Um, I get these very bright, and I'm sure you have more, you know, very bright, like creative types that come in, but they, they can't fill out their time sheet, or like, you know, it's like they can't do anything else. And I'm, I've had about enough of that. Like, we need to. Wait, there's cerebral. What's that? It's cerebral. Oh, a little too much stuff sometimes. It's yeah, like, okay, man. It's like, the, right. But it's just one meeting a week. It's at noon. Like, just come from time. You know, it's like, oh, God, it's like <laughs> well, but I created this whole thing and I wrote a 10 page paper about it. Like, <laughs> dude, like, we're not. And so I'm desperate for people to have both. Right? Yeah. Like, and it's a moving target. So maybe your problem is that your expectations are wrong. Seriously. I mean, if you go back 30 years, we needed to know how to add numbers. Now, there's no need to know that. I mean, there's no reason not to have kids have calculators. Why should you be able to look up on our CRC table what the sine of an angle is or the cosine of an angle is when it's a fraction of a second to calculate on your phone or on just talk to your watch and ask for the answer? You know, and so as we get to a more sophisticated society, that target changes too. And so I think we need to recognize that we're not going to find that like super geeky 1950s rocket scientists. They don't exist anymore because they don't need to exist because that world has changed. So, so are you seeing enough of the population coming out of high school and college that want the technical skill because they are learning? I'll tell you right now. I'll tell you right now. We are just. Yeah. Yeah. We're just absolutely failing the the education system as it relates to them. Because we've we're we're trying so hard to abstract things for them where they're graduating with like Python, you know, whatever. But that's way too, like like a lot of people just assume that innovation always moves forward. But we know from evidence that the, the innovation moves backwards because what happens is we abstract things to a point where People don't even understand how things work anymore. And at that point, like when we teach kids, you know, we teach when we can teach kids like um, you know, higher level programming languages or no code and you know, just logic, and then they like I've noticed that you know there doesn't seem to be a strong curriculum out there for Ross. But if you go out there and you try to get a job in robotics, the first thing that's gonna be on the thing is Ross. So how many kids are being taught ROS versus how many jobs out there are there where ROS is the central component? I am hiring for ROS, and he's looking for ROS. I'm looking for ROS. We're all looking for ROS. But who knows ROS? No one does because they're not teaching kids ROS. Not even in first robotics challenge or any of those, they're not teaching it. And that was what Misty was trying to do was like make it to where web developers, JavaScript could do a robot because no one's teaching ROS. You guys see Boulder and they they complain. They gotta spend the first two years teaching kids ROS. So the it really is just a misalignment in terms of A, we gotta be careful abstracting things too much. B, we have to teach people the skills that they're gonna need to know to even consider getting a job in the field. I'll just say that a mentorship a couple months ago. I think it's a two-part question with misalignment is where so on this side I tell kids hey if you wanted to be a football player and you're a little guy a little fast 120 pounder but you're really fast but the only person you know who plays football or the only person you know in robotics happens to be a lineman and you go out and try to be a lineman you're going to do awful right you're never going to be a lineman so on this side there's a book like I think it's called strength finder 2.0 that helps people get in the right lane so that helps. Then on this side, we have so much diversification. If you were to give everybody here a deck of cards and say, pick the five skills I need for this kid so I can give him a job, every, every hand would be different, which is great because we want diversification and different options. That's how we're going to solve these problems, not all thinking alike when we have one rocket ship that went up. So that was easier to find rocket scientists because there's only one ship they could all study the same plans. Now we have so much variety. So, it, and then there's, it's moving so fast that when this guy was in school 20 years ago, and he asked those questions 20 years later, all the languages are different. 
we're not all learning five years of Pascal anymore. At least we're learning languages in school that people need. Maybe not the exact one, but Pascal was an academic language where we learned logic. And that, like the kindergarten, like the or loops and and loops and conjunction, junction, what's your function kind of stuff. But yeah, so I think it's combining those two. And the third one is what jobs are needed. It's using um, bureaulandstatistics.gov. And it does, the government wants you to make money so they can tax you, right? It's in their best interest for you to find a job. So if you go on there, they'll give you the 10 year projection of all jobs. And they'll say, this job has a greater chance of growth in the next 10 years. This one, it's being automated, so I wouldn't do that. I used to be a medical lab tech, and I, I got to in the computers, but I was a low man in the Air Force pole, so I had to unload all the computers. This is how I was unloading them. I had to set them up in the computer room. And we just saw those that automation just wipe out jobs to where they just closed all the medical centers, medical lab tech schools in Colorado for about five years. They closed them in the Air Force because they just, they had a machine that could do work for 300 people. So it was a decade where they, you can see technology just hit the job market really hard. Well, I, I had a question that followed that, and that is, is that what jobs are not going to be automated? Huh? Which, which jobs which jobs do we want? That, their that, jobs. That, <laughs> that, that, there, there you go, their jobs. What jobs will not bother the machine? I, I can't think of one because you can automate any of them. Right. Well, but there's a difference between automate and automate well. <laughs> so you didn't ask that question. It's not necessarily automated because automation is different from robotics. Sure. So, you know, what what will you what will we not robot? Things that require it's up to your client. Yeah. Things that require uh, creativity are the ones that are going to be the last to be automated. Um, because even today's stuff can't do that stuff. And, and engineering is creative. Like I consider that creative activity. Um, and the space is so large that um, you can automate corners of it. And there's, you know, you can pull up a chipset and go, you know, I want a headset. And you press three buttons, and it's like here's your phone already. That one's done. Uh, but you know, if you want something truly unique, um, you're back to you know, good old engineering, and that takes some time. So that's it. So that that probably is the, the answer then. Professional services slash systems integrators would be the last <laughs> because because it will be hard to automate the. I don't know what the. Like whatever the problem is, whatever it is, whatever the systems you've got are, whatever the legacy, whatever, making it all work, uh, making it all work together. It's it it's gonna be a while before you know the systems can organize themselves so well that you don't need people to make the systems organize well. But I I'm trying to think I'm trying to think of other jobs that would I think that. There are some jobs that won't go away for political jobs. There you go. <laughs> I would so vote for a robot over most of the candidates. <laughs> those are, those should be the first. <laughs> but but like a police officer, we would That's not there's somebody who would be replacing the robot. Yeah, I mean, I think that yes, the, the need for interpersonal becomes something really hard to automate because really. Robots, AI, all of that tends to be, we've seen this before, so we can do it again. But if you think of like a therapist, ideally a therapist is like, you know, synthesizing vast amounts of data in real time and saying, well, the specifics of what you're telling me I haven't heard before, but here's some ideas, here's some big patterns and stuff. And for that to be genuine, I think it's going to be really hard for that to be a little Eliza robot sitting there, on, you know, on the other couch. Anyway, it's, it's, it's a fun thought. He was talking about the, the, you know, the job that you would want that isn't going to be automated. How do you figure out when that, that is? And when you want to automate it? So fixing VCR, probably not. We won't get market for that. Yeah, so, <laughs> so for a main TV. They gotta, yeah, so one last question. Let's end it with a great question. Who does a huge amount of pressure on Google? Last question. I wanted to go to what you were saying about Google, uh, the translate, which was already good getting better but it's also like you, you can't plug a 50,000 word novel cut and paste it into Google Translate it'll do a halfway decent job but at some point it'll get all boggled down I'm wondering if that's kind of what you guys are driving at is like 
there's only a certain level of robotic autonomy that can be achieved right now. And it, is there a parallel between how Google Translate is limited in its efficacy? It's great with single words, single sentences, but you start getting into passages, full pages, cut and pasting, and it starts to screw up. I think it's a great example because of this. That is one of the biggest, best tech companies in the world, working with the best set of data they possibly have. With all the computing resources they can, they still can't do it right, right? It's still not where we want it. And that, so that's an example, right? So everything else is gonna fall long, many years behind that, right? And again, that's just, they can, they have the words. They know what the words are. That's a huge, a huge thing. Well, I, I, I suspect the reason the law more pedantic in it that they didn't make it to do that. They didn't make it to didn't want to, to, yeah. to translate. They didn't assume that people would translate. So consumer level. So so because the, the, the truth is is the classifier that they're using that they're basing it off of is really good and could do it. They could they could do it. But the internet they didn't they didn't make it to where they, they didn't assume. So whatever whatever's falling apart there. It's it, it's based off the fact that the product people at Google didn't think you were going to do that, or didn't think that most people would use it that way, or didn't really. If that makes sense. Um, the underlying algorithm, there's no reason why that thing couldn't do a whole book in a second and get it all right if there was a reason to do that. So that's it's because the the algorithm that the the the, the, data, the algorithm they're using is open source. You can. You can do it yourself. You could make that product. Huh? Is that the Mozilla thing? No, it's I can't remember. It's not GPT three. I'm trying to think of which one. There's there's like four competing ones that are you know basically the classifier trained on some insane amount of you know text and stuff like that. But you know, it it really comes down to there's a, there there happens to be a lot between that algorithm and you and a lot of decisions they make. And I suspect that someone at some point made the decision that they were only going to try to accurately translate up to a paragraph. And after that, you're not trying to get them to translate a whole book. And so, and, and so that, that's, that's, I mean, it's, that's kind of hard. The, the, the fact that they're using neural nets, the fact that they're using neural nets as a classifier is fine, but that 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 doesn't that actually is part of the problem. Those things aren't built to read. They're not reasoning algorithms, and they're they're just they're just perception. You know, they're 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 there to replace a sense basically, and so they're good at that. Um, right. So yeah, it's a pre-programmed sense too. Think about it. Neural you know net. What they're doing, like it's pre programmed to go this way. They can't think out there, so like, they can't go out this way. It's tunnel vision. Well, I mean, it's all it's doing is it's, it's calculating the probability for something, for you something. know, for that, that this is that, that this is what you're trying to say. And like you said, the problem is is that they're not calculating it out to where they're, try, you're, they're trying to put it in context up to a couple sentences. They, they don't assume that you're going to want a whole book in context. Because who like what's the what, what's the size of the market trying to actually do that? Usually, if you're trying to you you try to go online, you're trying to get a couple sentences for whatever reason. That's the reason. Yeah. So tomorrow we're all gonna wake up thinking, did this really happen? <laughs> Was I really at a lot of fun? <laughs> all right. And with that, I will say thank you all very much. Especially thank you, Jalali and Caleb. Thank Super you. interesting conversation. Come to New Tech again. Sign up with Jennifer, be part of the team, and come and check out this space again. I got the tour, you should too. Yeah, there secret. are secret crypts in the basement and stuff we can't talk about, but there's ghosts, there's like names of, who knows what's going on here. I told her I said 23 showed up, only 20 left, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we just left a few. So yeah, um, head up to the out for a tour, if anybody wants to take a tour, uh, any leftovers that and the leftovers, I have some containers over here. You can take it all. And Please make our work easy. And the food doesn't get better now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.